Okay, here we are back on you know the side of the road in Texas looking like a couple of yahoos looking at shit. Uh, this is a pretty interesting plant. This is a member of the Ailanthus family and the Crucifixion Thorn family, uh, at least if you're referring to the genus Castilla. This is Leitneria, and this is species Pelosa. You got the uh, Leitneria Pelosa and Leitneria Floridana, and only two species in a genus, and only one genus in a family. It used to be in its own family, which is pretty odd. Always interested in monotypic families. Monotypic just means it's the only one in that uh, in that particular genus or family or order or whatever. And it normally implies a long lone branch on an evolutionary lineage. It means means this broke off a while ago, didn't really diversify, just you know. Uh, I don't know, it's, it's pretty odd, you know, why did it not radiate, why are there no more species, etc. Were they there, did it go extinct, or did it just, it just kind of, uh, was a recent emergence, or uh, whatever, and what the shit, you know, monotypic uh, genera and families are pretty interesting. Uh, regardless, this is Leitneria, you can see it's got those uh, hairy stems, it's got a really odd distribution too, it only occurs in this small uh, patch of uh, Texas, just southwest of Houston, uh, kind of somewhat close to the coast before you start going west and get a little bit of elevation gain uh, and uh, by elevation gain of course I just mean you know 200 feet we're still pretty low right here 200 feet is considered elevation gain at least in East Texas when you're close to the coast and uh, again it gets when it does flower and fruit it's got axile meaning close to the stem uh, flowers and fruits much like uh, Castilla or like uh, I guess Atlantis doesn't have it Atlantis is a little bit different tree of heaven but that's uh, anyway point is they're both in the same family Cimarubaceae uh, in the order Sapindale same order as maples uh, and this doesn't you know this is about this is pretty medium size for them it's not a big tree but again it's a weird evolutionary branch it's a monotypic uh, plant and uh, again it's only only occurs uh, you know here in a uh, in uh, south southeast Texas and uh, two two populations in Arkansas and that's it that's the only place that this plant is found in the whole world. Yeah, pretty fuzzy, uh, got a nice indumentum over there on the abaxial surface right there. Hairy stems, and then you can see it almost looks like a willow the way it's got those buds. This, you know, secondary buds coming up above uh, where the, the leaf, uh, the leaf rachis is. I know, interesting plant. Wish I could catch it in flower and fruit. Anyway, here's a nice uh, patch of uh, poison ivy. I'm gonna get naked and walk into it. Go fuck yourself. Okay, so here I am back in a, the habitat known as Tamalapin Thorn Scrub. Uh, it is hot as balls. It's also very dry. Uh, there's buffalo grass everywhere, real bad invasive. Uh, you can see dominant plants are, of course, mesquite, prosopis species, acacia rigidula. You got a yuck over there, too. I want to point out this plant right here. Now, you can see this is just photosynthesizing through its stems. It doesn't even have any leaves, but sometimes it does when it's, you know, growing, if it's wet out or, you know, a little bit of moist or whatever, it's got rudimentary leaves, but they just end up looking like little scale, like bricks that basically fall off. Most of the photosynthesis here is going on in these stems, which are, of course, filled with chlorophyll. Now, this is a pretty old plant, uh, pretty old individual of this species. You know, normally when you see them, you see them a little bit smaller. Another common name for this plant is a crucifixion thorn, but again, Common names are kind of shit since crucifixion thorn also refers to another unrelated plant in a family, Cimarubaceae. That unrelated plant being Castilla emorii. There's actually a couple different uh, species of Castilla. But this plant, to cut to the chase, the name of this plant is Cobralinia spinosa. You can see why it's called spinosa. So again, it's Cobralinia spinosa. It's in the family Cobralineaceae. It used to be in a caper family, but they redid the phylogenetics when they went and looked at the DNA. Uh, and it's actually in the, the mustard order, the order of mustards, Brassicales. So you got two species in a genus Cobralinea. The other one I think is Holocantha. Holoc I forget. It's in Bolivia. It's down there in South America. Those are the only two species in the entire goddamn family. And this guy, this is an old bastard. You know, like I said, normally when I seen some a couple um, uh, days ago, when I woke up on some random bastard's land, he ended up being a nice old man, but he was kind of tripped out at first. I wouldn't recommend doing that again because they will shoot you down here. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> Cobra Linea, uh, you know, normally you see it. It's only about three or four feet tall, but this is an old one. And you can see the, uh, the, the bark over there. When you get in there and look at it, it's black, but then there's areas where it's just been covered in 
uh, this kind of white lichen that tends to form on everything, this kind of gray lichen. I actually wonder what species of lichen that is, because it's very common and it's on all the acacias and the mesquites and what the shit. Uh, the, the flowers, the little white flowers, I guess the berries are hit with the birds. Unfortunately, nothing's flowering right now because it's, you know, again, it's hot as balls. But, uh, you know, pretty interesting plant right there. I mean, it's really taking the whole uh, the whole xeric habitat thing to a new extreme. It's well adapted to it. Nothing's going to be trying to gnaw on this, uh, you know, um, obviously, because it's just, it's just unpleasant. You know, but it's also nice you could take a handful of this, you know, put it on your buddy's car seat so that when he sits down, he gets all the thorns in his ass. You know, you don't want to hurt his balls or nothing, but you could just put it just for his ass. You know, especially if he's got a big ass, it's going to be sufficient cushioning for these when they go right in there. You know, you, there's obviously the, the room, there's, mo there's so much room to play with this, at least in the area of practical jokes or say, you know, bondage, uh, uh, you know, abuse, as long as you got a safe word, etc. Your safe word could be brassicales, actually, if you wanted to. You know, I'm not going to tell you what your safe word is, though. You pick whatever. Regardless... It's a wonderful goddamn plant, important component of the deserts, and it's all over northern Mexico. There's even a couple areas where this plant, Cobra spinosa, occurs in, uh, in Baja. Like in central Baja, kind of closer to the Gulf, you know? Not on the Pacific side, but closer to the Gulf. Anyway, I'm going to go see what, uh, what, the, what the shit else we got going on. Okay, so this juicy bastard, you can obviously tell, is in the pea family, the legume family, Fabaceae, lunilocular, a unilocular ovary with uh, two rows of seeds right there. Uh, locule is just basically a compartment. It's just basically a seed compartment. It's a fancy way to say one seed chamber, you know? So one seed chamber with two rows of seeds. Ebonopsis is a genus, has two species in it. It's Ebonopsis ebono. Goes all the way down to the Yucatan, uh, you know, occurs in South Texas, then all the way down to the Yucatan. Uh, you know, important, uh, it's in a mimosa subfamily, so it's got those little fairy duster, uh, you know, clusters of uh, flowers. And it's important for uh, for the bugs and the pollinators and shit, you know. This one is actually pretty interesting. Uh, this is in a different family. This is in Ramnaceae, as you might be able to tell just from looking at those very uh, pronounced veins in there. This is Karwinskia humboldtiana. And this is actually uh, one of the most toxic plants uh, around me right now. It's, uh, you know, it's a very, the berries and shit are, uh, I, I believe they induce paralysis and then, uh, you know, a kind of a slow, protracted death that doesn't sound too pleasant. Karwinski has got quite a few species in it. I think nine or ten, you know, but it's one of those other uh, desert Ramnaceae. And if you'll uh, remember, Ramnaceae, of course, is the buckthorn family, European buckthorn, real bad invasive species in the Midwest. Then you got all the Ceanothus, wonderful genus of native uh, shrubs and sometimes small trees out in California, uh, as well as, uh, you know, the center of diversity for Ceanothus is in California. But then, of course, you got more. Uh, you got a couple other species in the east. But uh, Ramnacea is very big in the deserts. Ramnacea has been very successful in the deserts. You got, uh, you got a, what, Adolphia, Zizyphus, multiple genera uh, in, in, in uh, the deserts, in the Zeric areas. And part of the way that uh, Ramnacea does this, obviously this one doesn't do it because it's uh, so, I mean, it's enough of a deterrent to be so potently toxic that you kill whatever eats you. But some of the other Ramnacea have modified their stems into spines. So, you know, it's just Ramnacea's version of a spine, just like Cacti's version of a spine is a leaf and Euphorbia's version of a spine is a stipule. Uh, Ramnacea's version of a spine is just turning those shoots into those branches, into terminal branches with very sharp pointed ends on, on them that, of course, will stab and uh, protrude into the flesh of whatever tries to eat them and uh, thereby, uh, you know, decreasing the chances of herbivory. And remember, there's a lot of selective pressure since there's not much growing in the, in the desert. There's a lot of selective pressure on anything that's green. So that's why, again, that's why cacti have spines and other plants have, you know, uh, milky latex that's very irritating or uh, secondary chemistry that can cause death and paralysis. Oh, yeah, so here's a real nice one. Okay, so this is a member of the family Rutaceae, the citrus family. And normally when you think of the citrus family, you, of course, think of lemons and oranges and all that shit. You know, you need a nice lime for your Topo Chico and shit because you can't drink anymore because you turn into an asshole and you get pretty mouthy when you have uh, when you got too many in you. Anyway, so you normally think of the, the, the fruits of the citrus family, but the citrus family is actually another family that's pretty... Uh, 
pretty common and widespread in the North American deserts. You know, think of Thamnosma, Montana. Think of Putalea. It's Talea with a P. And, uh, you know, then you think of this one, Helieta parvifolia. Now, the genus Helieta has two species in it. One's in Cuba and is very rare and endangered. And uh, then there's this one, uh, which, of course, you see in uh, the deserts here in South Texas and northern Mexico. And, again, it's got those trifoliate leaves like Putalea. And uh, it's got very tiny flowers, you know. But again, like most members of the family Rutaceae, it's got those pellucid glands, those little, those little oil glands. You get them on the stem, and you get them on the uh, the fruits and shit. Now this, now remember, you normally think of the citrus family, but not all the, uh, the members of the Rutaceae produce obviously citrus fruits or or uh, or those kind of fruits. Some of them produce what's called samaras, little flaky bastards. You know, for instance, Talea does that. Uh, Damnosma Montana, which is a shrub you get in a desert south, you know, Mojave and Sonora Desert and shit. Real weird looking fucking plant. Wonderful plant, though. It's got little purple fruits and I think purple flowers, maybe. Maybe it's purple fruits and green. No, purple flowers, green fruit. Either way, it's got green and purple in it. Real pretty plant. You crush that shit up. It smells very, uh, very pungent. You could smell those oils in there. You could smell it's in the citrus family. And same with this. When you crush this foliage up, it's got those glands in there. The vascular tissue is just ridden with those uh, terpenes and wonderful smelling oils and shit. Oh, yeah, look. It's my old friend, Paraxis pistillaris. One of the only mushrooms you ever see in the North American deserts, along with the Montagnia ori over there. Uh, this is a, basically, it's like a stacked puffball, you know, so it pops up. And I've seen them when they're, you know, I've seen them when they're wet. I've seen, I've seen some in Death Valley in April when they were wet still, when they were fresh. But, you know, and, and they look a lot different. They look kind of juicy, almost like you want to take a bite out of it, which I don't recommend. Uh, though I don't know, I don't think they're too deadly or nothing. I think they might maybe make you puke or something. But uh, regardless, <clears throat> so when they're fresh, they come up, they put this big, this big uh, puff, uh, puffy thing up there. But it's not a typical, you know, uh, camp style mushroom. It's basically, like I said, just a stocked puffball. And then when it dries out, that's when the magic happens. And you just basically get a big cluster of spores, which then get knocked over by an obnoxious dog or an obnoxious human being. And, uh, and then disperse the spores everywhere. And, you know, I really wonder what the shit they're eating down there. You know, and of course... They can only be active, uh, you know, when the when it's got moisture, when the soil's got moisture in it, and then they probably just go dormant. I would actually be very interested to study Podaxis pistillaris because I have seen it all over the goddamn, you know, Mexico, the American Southwest, anywhere where it gets hot as balls and the soil gets sufficiently dry. This is one of the only mushrooms you see over there with Montagnia. This is the, one of the only ones, and they're obviously very successful. Whatever they're doing is working for them. But what the fuck are you eating down there? How do you, what are you eating that enables you to live? They gotta be saprotrophic. They're not mycorrhizal. They're saprotrophic. They're living on dead stuff, old roots, old organic matter, some shit. But, you know, they're, again, they're everywhere. There's all the spores nice. Now I'm gonna do some lines of it. Now this beautiful bastard is a tree that you only get in the United States in South Texas. This is what's known as a Texas olive, but it's not in Oleaceae. It's got no relation uh, the olive trees. This is actually uh, in the Boraginaceae. So it's a relative of Phacelia. Oh, apparently there's a biting red ants on it too, uh, which are actually biting me as I'm holding this. But uh, anyway, the flowers on this are a real gem to see. Uh, hopefully I can find some that are flowering. Again, it's in Boraginaceae. And like most things in Boraginaceae, it's got quite a few uh, trichomes on the leaves especially in those abaxial surfaces. Remember, mostly when you get trichomes and hairs and shit on the leaves and whatnot, they're going to be on that abaxial surface because that's where the stoma are. That's where the gas pores are. And that's where you want... Okay, these ants are starting to hurt. That's where you want... That's where the gas pores are. That's where you're going to get leakage. You know, you're taking in that CO2 and that's where you're going to get leakage of your moistures and your juices and whatnot. That's where you're going to transpire all your water. So that's why you put the trichomes... Uh, on the bottom of the leaf surface because that helps you it lets you transpire gases while at the same time Minimizing the amount of water you lose through the moisture and shit. So anyway, Boraginaceae uh, I think there's like 300 400 species in a goddamn genus This only occurs in South Texas then it goes on down into Nuevo Leon and Tamaulipas and I maybe it goes down into uh it was not a Veracruz. No, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Actually, I don't know. I just know it's mostly northern Mexico and South Texas. Oh, yeah, there we go. It's the Xiphus obtusifolia. Remember I was telling you there's members of the Ramnaceae that just uh, 
basically turn their shoots into spines. That's what's going here. They turn their shoots into spines, then they photosynthesize through the stem. They barely got any leaves yet, but I think that might be because the critters have actually uh, actively gnawed them off, uh, which seems to be what's going on. But no matter, you know, the Zyphus doesn't give a shit. Yes, yeah, see, here's the new foliage. Before that tissue's hardened off, it's got the leaves and everything, and then once the, once the tissue hardens off, they just turn into these nice stabby spines. And look at those vertical striations on the stem. See those vertical marks? That's a big identifying factor. Nice as Zyphus. Okay, is that it? Where are you going? You know, you move pretty fast for a turtle. Oh, oh. 